factors has to be revisited compared to when you were dealing with DNA. And this is true for uh, all, all, all technologies, but um, there's no tricks of amplifying proteins like there is for DNA, for example. You can't do like PCR. So yeah, you're, 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 you need to work with the samples that you're, that you're given. You cannot amplify it. Um, so what are the strategies that the field are applying to try to tackle this problem of protein analysis with nanopores? Well, there's of course the idea of sequencing and this is really the, uh, the ultimate goal is to try to read really the full sequence and there's promising improvements towards this, but, but you need to move similar to DNA, you need to make this amino acid chain pass through in a single file fashion through your pore and be a, in order to decode it. Um, but a lot of applications don't necessarily require you to decode the full sequence of the protein. Uh, if you're trying to do singly to detect a known panel of biomarkers of proteins, uh, simply ad identifying them using some sort of fingerprinting technology could be enough. And so there are also other schemes where you're only looking to see if you cannot detect the presence of uh, a at least two amino acids. And if you know where they are mapped along the sequence, it can really allow you to uniquely identify the protein. You don't need to know the entire sequence, but just uh, at least two amino acids and where they are uh, in order to make identification. And then uh, another, may, another way of, of analyzing the protein is to keep it in the folded state and simply analyze the shape, uh, the charge, uh, the dipole moment uh, that this protein has. And this way you can also try to find unique characteristics uh, to analyze the protein in its native folded state. And so these are the type of signals that you can expect for these different kinds of, of schemes. And they kind of all look the same in the sense that you get other uh, variations in the fluctuations in the current, depending on the, each of the identity of the amino acids. Or you've got here also like uh, more pronounced changes for the different potential labels that are on specific amino acids. Uh, in this last case here, this protein uh, fully folded and translocating through the pore will pass in and could be tumbling inside the pore and rotating. And you might be able to see then sort of this rotational diffusion happening and then get a signal that gives you sort of fluctuations in how much current is being blocked. And then, uh, a lot of the fun comes in during the analysis. There's a lot of approaches you can use to do protein analysis or pre signal analysis from the nanopore signals. Um, uh, and uh, of course, as you can imagine, uh, many machine learning techniques right now are very useful for, for that kind of problem. All right. So uh, very recently, there's been some progress towards this uh, idea of protein sequencing with nanopores. And I'm here, I'm showing you the work uh, from uh, Case Deckers and Jens Goodlack's groups, uh, they join forces and they work together to demonstrate uh, this ability to do some peptide sequencing. And they achieved this using the very similar system as they did, or as Jens, you did for, pro for uh, DNA sequencing, except they use a chimeric structure where they uh, bound, uh, they, they click chemistry, they attach a peptide chain to a piece of DNA and then use a uh, DNA motor that attached to the DNA piece to move the DNA segment. And that also made the protein, uh, the peptide, sorry, uh, 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 polymer to, to move through the pore. And so this allowed them to get a signal that uh, was proportional to that peptide sequence. And they showed um, through this really controlled movement of the peptide through the pore that they could distinguish the sequence and also distinguish particular amino acid substitutions or modifications at the single amino acid level. And so this was pretty exciting uh, work that happened just uh, the last few years or the last year. Um, so there are, uh, this is was using one type of enzyme or molecular motor to control the motions. There are other schemes that also uses different kinds of, of enzymes that can directly uh, 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 attach uh, a protein and, and thread a protein through, uh, but we don't have time to really cover all the schemes, uh, possible schemes. Um, another interesting uh, ways of seeing how you can analyze protein using, using nanopores is uh, using a nanopore of uh, reducing its size. So if the protein, if the pore compared to the protein is larger, 
what you expect is the protein to translocate through the pore and pass block some amount of current and move quite rapidly through the pore. But as your pore is smaller and smaller, there's gonna be more and more interaction between the protein and the pore, and it's going to have some friction and it's going to get stalled inside the pore. And what you see here is essentially, as you're making the pore smaller from five nanometers down to 2.5 or even two nanometers, you're essentially having these very long lived events. So the, uh, the protein gets captured by the pore, gets stuck there, and then actually undergoes a conformational transition. You got to unfold the protein, unwind it, and then so that it can so that it can pass the pore. And what you're seeing in your signal is essentially at least these two states that shows some sort of docking of the protein and unfolding of the protein during the passage. And you can measure as a function of the force that you're applying to these proteins. So a function of the applied voltage that you're applying across the membrane. Uh, you can measure sort of the, these, the, the kinetics of, of, these, uh, of, of these states uh, to map some sort of energy landscape of, um, of the protein. And that's a way to get some sort of fingerprinting information about the protein, not just about its shape, but also about its energy landscape this way. And so, of course, uh, uh, this you know we went from the completely unfolded peptide chain to a squeezing of a protein through a pore, but you can also use a pore that's big enough to allow the fully native protein to pass through and do some analysis to get some information about uh, that protein. And so here I'm showing you uh, work from Michael Mayer's lab where he shows that he's able to uh, pass protein through the pore, and if they go in slow enough, He's able to see this, these proteins tumble and through some geometric model extract essentially uh, from volume exclusion model, extract some based on the current distribution, extract some uh, shape factors from these proteins. And he's able to then uh, separate different proteins based on, on these uh, fluctuating signals. So we are also starting to do this kind of research in my lab. And uh, one of the things we're trying to do is to try to make sure that we understand the dynamics of this transport process. So how those, those proteins are getting captured and translocated. Because like I said, uh, initially proteins uh, don't have a uniform charge. They, some amino acids are gonna be positive, others negative. And so here we did a test, a control study where we wanted to study uh, this very simple protein, uh, uh, green fluorescent protein, GFP, which is about uh, 2.4 diameter uh, and 4.2 nanometer in length, um, so relatively small. And we are translocating it through a about a five nanometer pore. Uh, the net charge of GFP is about minus uh, eight electrons. And so if we apply uh, a proper polarity of the electric field, we are thinking we're gonna capture it through the pore. And this is indeed what we see is we see a lot of signals and each, are, each of these are a single GFP protein getting captured and translocated. But if we zoom in and look at the, each event in, you know, more precisely and look as a function of uh, voltage or force, what we see is something a bit counterintuitive is we see that the signals become uh, shallower with increasing force. So they don't, they're not as deep. And the signals become also longer with increasing force. So the molecule seems to stay longer in the pore as we are increasing the voltage. Uh, this is shown here uh, in this figure. This is the distribution of the ionic current blockage as a function of different voltages. And you can see that the, the blockage uh, distribution becomes tighter for uh, higher voltages, whereas it's wider for lower voltages. And this is the uh, mean, the uh, most probable dwell time, so the passage time. And you can see there is sort of an exponential behavior. Uh, uh, so the molecules are getting uh, stuck in the pore longer with increasing voltage. And so our hypothesis for understanding what is going on here, because it was very uh, non-intuitive initially if we compare it to what we know for, for DNA, is uh, it's about the dipole moment of this protein, essentially. So there's a particular dipole moment and there is a non-uniform uh, electric field from our nanopore, right? The exterior electric field on the other side is a non-uniform non field. And so when the 
the molecule uh, gets captured, its dipole is going to align with the electric field and it's going to go inside the pore. But then as soon as it's uh, trying to escape, there is this, the dipole, the non, the non uniform field actually makes the molecule go back in. And so this creates sort of a trap. So because of the dipole moment of our protein, we can actually trap those protein inside the pore and study it for a longer time. So uh, we think here this, you know, we can then think about this as being a, a trap, a potential well where our, our molecule is trapped and, and this exponential factor here gives us information about the energy scale for that trapping behavior. Um, and we feel like we also have less fluctuation in the current because we have more alignment of the dipole with the electric field at higher field. All right, I have to speed up, I think a little bit. What, uh, 10, okay, yeah, I'll probably speed up a little bit, all right. The other applications I wanted to tell you were about in sort of the diagnostics uh, area where we actually use nanopores to measure biomarkers in clinical samples. And we did a couple of studies where we uh, looked at, uh, uh, this was for studying uh, group A streptococcus, um, which is a bacteria responsible for strep throat in, uh, in, uh, in patients. And so we took some throat swab and extracted the nucleic acid um, and then ran a PCR amplification and counted the number of amplicons uh, for that, but, you know, based on the primers to make sure that we see if we had a particular um, uh, trace of that, uh, of that bacteria inside, inside our sample. And so these kinds of studies basically rely on a, an increase in capture rate for this amplicon marker from that PCR amplification. And we did something similar for a, uh, a well-known virus where we wanted to measure the number of RNA copies that have, were present in a sample. And we also used an amplification technology associated with this. Uh, this, this time was an isothermal amplification technology, so constant temperature. And we also showed that we could detect an increase in the signal rate for this, uh, for our amplicon population or the, the, the number of copies that were generated during this amplification step to, to call a, a sample positive or negative. But our ability to quantify was a bit limited by these schemes, essentially because when we're measuring concentration uh, using this capture rate, it's analogous to measuring concentration uh, by looking at intensity fluctuation, uh, uh, intensity uh, value by, by a fluorescent signal. And this is essentially uh, uh, measuring the absolute amount of, this, of the sample, right? By looking at the intensity uh, signal to know about the, the concentration. We're not really taking full advantage of the fact that we're counting single molecules uh, in these kinds of measurements. If, you're, if you think of single molecules, if you can distinguish on an event by event basis, the molecules, you'd think that you would be able to really develop a digital scheme where you could free yourself from any instrumentation noise and then do better quantification this way. And so uh, uh, it's essentially, if you have, if you're able on an event by event basis to distinguish the presence or the absence of the target by measuring molecules that indicate the presence and the target when they transfer getting through the pore, then you can really do a true digital measurements and then do quantification based on that and then you don't care about the noise of your system. Essentially what this means is that it's easier to do counting a molecule than it is to integrate the signal, right? And so we uh, attempted, to, well, we did this in a couple of case studies and um, I don't wanna run, I, I need to run fast through these to tell you a little bit about other things in, 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 my, in my talk. Uh, but briefly here we use these magnetic beads covered with antibodies to capture specific proteins of interest and then converted our protein of interest uh, using a secondary detector antibody uh, that had a, these DNA probes that were attached to it. These are short single-stranded DNA probes. And then to create uh, so these single-stranded DNA molecules are, in, in fact, uh, proxies for our protein of interest in our clinical samples. And to create a digital signal to measure the presence and the absence, we incubated them with these DNA nanostructures that could be made to hybridize with these single-stranded DNA proxies. And the absence of the target is simply when our nanostructures are translocating just one at a time. 
but the presence uh, or one of our molecules are detected when actually two of these nanostructures are hybridized together in a dumbbell format using this single-stranded DNA piece. And then uh, we record our signal and we see all these nice electrical signatures. We can distinguish whether it's a zero or a one. And the number of zero and one are the fraction of dumbbells, the fractions that are in this dumbbell format tells us information about the concentration. So this is a, a calibration curve essentially for this uh, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH um, uh, protein marker. And as a function of this dumbbell fraction, we see this linear response. This was from uh, human samples, uh, human ser serum samples. And we showed we could detect as low as a few hundred femtomolar and sort of our limit of detection using, using this, uh, this detection strategy using a single pore and not an array of pores. And most recently, we've also redeveloped the, the scheme a little bit to uh, not have to deal with the tyranny of uh, two-step hybridization steps and uh, did a similar scheme now for a different target, which was a, for a, a traumatic brain injury target, GFAB, and uh, this time from plasma sample, then we show we could go to an equivalent sort of limit of detection of about 300 femtomolar uh, using a similar sort of idea of counting this fraction of this time circular fraction versus linear rod molecules going through the pore. All right, the last 10 minutes of my talk, uh, what I wanna cover is uh, going back to telling you about some of the fundamental polymer transport study that we do in my group as well, because a lot of these uh, sensing applications really only work if you understand how well your system can, can operate. So you can really optimize, uh, optimize them. And I showed you the two sensing uh, detection diagnostic uh, schemes, and, and those have academic merit for limit of detection, maybe, but they're not going to be that useful until you can really multiplex this thing to detecting multiple proteins uh, in parallel. And one way you can do that is to use uh, DNA barcodes to encode a digital signal that can give you the identity of the protein you're trying to detect, and then followed by the presence or the absence of the protein. This way you don't need to only rely on the protein signal itself, uh, uh, which could be in a very complex matrix when you're dealing with, with uh, clinical samples. So this idea of having a, a digital barcode is really a way to do multiplexing uh, in addition to storing information on, on molecule this way. And you can do high multiplexing this, this way. Um, but your ability to decode this information really depends on how well you understand the passage of these molecules to the pore. How fast are they going? Is the what is the velocity profile? And essentially, this is the type of work that one of my students in my group is doing. Uh, Martin Charon is really interested in all the fundamental aspect of polymer transports, because despite 20 or 25 years of research in this nanopore field, there's still a big gap between theory and experiment to understand the whole aspect of the translocation process. And this is from understanding in which capture regime you're operating in uh, to understand how to build a calibration curve to understanding which monomer of this polymer chain gets captured first to understand the, the folding state of this polymer to how fast it's translocating to looking at this velocity profile. And so uh, here I'm gonna only tell you what he did to try to look at this velocity profile. So is this, is this velocity uniform or is it fluctuating as a function of, 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 of the passage? And so to do this, he created a polymer using DNA origami that had speed markers at different location along the length. This allowed him to sort of really map the velocity uh, along the way. And uh, he made this 5,000 base pair po polymer that had these regions about 500 base pairs apart that were triple strands based on the way that the DNA was folded. And this is the signal you get when these molecules are going through. You get the blockage from the single, from the linear double stranded uh, uh, segment, and then you get the deeper blockages from the uh, three helix bundle segments. And if you now collect uh, hundreds of single molecule event and look at the single file uh, translocations, and then you average out and measure the mean passage time for all of these sub segments, you can uh, plot them as a function of the contour length of your polymer. And you can get this kind of uh, velocity profile essentially. And what you see is this, you see that the polymer goes in at a particular velocity, slows down and then accelerate again. And this is 
I would say, well known from tension propagation theory. And at the molecular level, tension propagation theory essentially says that when the polymer gets captured, uh, you know, one, you know, by one end, it, it starts to go through. And then there is, there is there's going to be, you know, this is a non-equilibrium process. And so there's tension that propagates through the chain. And so your more segment of the DNA is set into motion. And this increases the, th the, the friction, essentially. As more polymer is moving, you have more friction. And this explains the slowing down here of, of, this, of this polymer. Up until the tension front reaches the end of the polymer, where then there's no, uh, uh, the, the friction term starts to reduce. And then you get acceleration towards the end and the fastest translocation when there's essentially no more friction on the outside. So what we're essentially seeing here is, is, is keeping the pore size constant. The friction inside the pore doesn't change. But since the length outside of the pore changes during translocation, you're essentially uh, this interplay between the intra and the inter friction uh, of the system. So what he did that was uh, very interesting is that he's actually mapped this velocity profile as a function of pore size. And what he shows is that bigger pores actually have a greater velocity fluctuations than smaller pores. And this is because you're, uh, you're keeping the same, this is the same molecule length, always 5,000 base pair, but the bigger nanopores essentially have a reduced contribution from the internal friction compared to smaller pores. And so when it's the exterior friction that dominates, you see a lot of fluctuations. Whereas when it's the interior friction that dominates, you can see a flatter profile. So for smaller pores of nine nanometers, you can see that the velocity is more or less flat, except at the end, whereas on the other way around. So if you're designing a sensing scheme using nanopores and you want to be able to map correctly the position of different labels on your molecule, knowing this velocity profile allows you to map the, the time signal into a position more accurately. All right, so I'm out of time. Um, I'll say one last thing is we are able to do all these measurements because we are able to fabricate nanopores. And the way we fabricate nanopores is by a technique that we've uh, essentially invented in my lab that doesn't rely on these complex instrumentation. We can sculpt matter and make nanometer scale holes down to a single nanometer uh, size with angstrom precision only using uh, a nanoscale spark. So essentially, uh, taking a membrane, intact membrane in solution and applying an electric field across it with a strength close to the dielectric breakdown strength of the material. And this creates a breakdown, a dielectric breakdown. Uh, but we control the damage that we do of that breakdown with, with atomic precision so that we can sculpt the pore to be of the exact size that we need. And this essentially replaced um, TM drilling of pores or million dollar equipment with a simple electrical circuits that can be battery operated. And we can simply apply a voltage, create our pore, grow it to the size that we want with angstrom precision for the particular experiment that we want. And this was the basis for the technology that uh, we developed in my lab and ultimately started to commercialize. Um, uh, so the Oxford, uh, sorry, no. Northern Nanopore Instrument was the company that uh, we created about in, 20, in February 2020 or March 2020. And we were selling these instruments uh, to the scientific community that allowed people to, that needed nanopores to, to fabricate nanopores in their lab. And we sold about 50 systems to different researchers worldwide for the last three years until uh, a few weeks back where we got acquired by Oxford Nanopore Technologies. Um, and uh, you know the, we are now basically integrating their technology, our own technologies into into theirs, uh, to see what we can offer in the future. And so I will skip these nice uh, mid-journey pictures, and simply to tell you that the work that I've showed you here is really the result of a lot of the great students in my group uh, that are uh, really hardworking and and are really passionate about all this. Thank you very much. Vincent, Vincent, I agree, agree to repeat the question, but I can also run to you if you if you need to ask a question. 
Uh, hi, you might have alluded to this earlier, but with regards to like the protein sequencing, are you just interested in um the actual amino acid sequence or also like the folding structure um, via this nanopore method? Yeah, so I, I or both. So um, I think nanopores can be developed into tools that can characterize uh, both the fully folded structure and even uh, looking at fluctuations a bit like what Claudio is doing uh, with threat measurements where you're looking at fluctuations uh, of protein structures. Uh, nanopores can also be made to do that. You, if you could trap a protein inside the pore, you could also then see it, its movement. Uh, so right now we're def developing different methods, different techniques to analyze proteins and both either on fully unfolded proteins or fully folded proteins. Um, uh, so right now it's an yeah uh, research and research effort to see which you know which techniques can really provide the most valuable information, um, and then we'll you know is, is this a technology that stays in sort of in academic labs versus becoming a useful you know commercial technology? It's also something that uh, requires to be seen. But yeah. Uh, when you were talking about um, like comparing biological pores and silicone pores, you there are some um, like layers of silicones, right? Yeah. And I was wondering if there's any chance of manipulating that into more complex like nanopore structure, like structures. All right. Sorry, I've lost my slides here. I'm not sure what's going on. Um, there we go. So I, I, me I meant to, so this microphone only speaks to Zoom, so I meant to repeat your questions. And your, your question was about uh, the structures of the nanopores? Yes, like different... Uh, different layers of materials? Different layers of like silicone materials, right? Is there a yeah. new chance for us to like manipulate that to more specific ways? Yeah, that's a great question. So it... So, uh, so one of the advantage of the solid state materials, uh, so it's in nanopores is that you can sculpt pores out of different materials. And so um, it depends what your applic end application is, right? For example, uh, if you're trying to map uh, something small in a molecule, you need to have the thinnest possible membrane. Uh, but how do you make a very thin membrane that's also very stable? And so here people are playing tricks with uh, different uh, films and film stacks to really have like these atomic layer deposition systems to cover different uh, materials. Um, but the fabrication technology can, uh, different approaches can make pores in different materials and different structures. Um, but it, yeah, it, ultimately your, the question depends on the what is your ultimate applications and what you're trying out for, for the signal. But ultimately the thinner the membrane, the more signal you have. Uh, and the more spatially resolved you can be as well. John? Is, <clears throat> excuse me, would it, would it be possible or would it be of any interest to make pores of shapes other than circular or maybe lattices of pores or more complicated structures? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question too. So, um, Right, so the, the shape of the pore matters a lot actually for, for focusing the electric field inside the pore. You saw that those biological pores have about the same length as the total same length as our solid state nanopores, which are about five to 10 nanometers in length. Uh, but they don't have a cylindrical shape. They have sort of a, a funnel shape or, or, or hourglass shape. And this allows to constrict the electric field to smaller regions of the pore that give you more re resolution power of the pore this way. Um, when you are uh, fabricating on solid state material, you're a little bit at the mercy of your capabilities in fabrication. Um, I think for TM drilling, uh, you might be able to make pores of different shapes. Uh, I know that there's a group that also studied, um, did some machine learning uh, strategies to find like what, what is the ultimate shape pores in 2D materials to provide the best resolution to do sequencing. So there's an interesting areas that, uh, there too, um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. How do you harvest the biological nanopores to integrate into your experiment? 
Yeah. So I, uh, so how do you harvest biological nanopores for experiments? Um, I, I don't, I'm, I, I don't, really, I don't do myself biological nanopores, but I think you can, so uh, you can express the proteins, uh, uh, you can encode the sequence for the protein, you can express it and you can uh, clean it up using your standard uh, molecular biology uh, techniques. Uh, or some some pores, some toxins uh, are commercially available, and you can buy them, uh, resuspend them, and and um, and and use them. Um, or you can buy one of those Oxford systems and hack it uh, for your purpose as well, because those are embedded pores inside the membranes. Yeah. Yes. So. Okay. Um, very interesting talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if people have tried to make like nano wells where you could like trap a protein sterically or mechanically so that you don't have to rely on having it at a dipole moment to trap it. Right. So your question is about uh, finding ways of trapping proteins and specifically building uh, uh, not a through hole, but simply a well to trap the protein inside. Yeah, so you could have like a nanopore, but then you block one in, and then yeah. you, by diffusion, some protein will get into right. that well, and then you can do like single single yeah, protein yeah, measurement. Yeah, so there are people in the field uh, of you know um, single molecule analysis that have uh, uh, used similar approaches like that. Um, so uh, what comes to mind is uh, the work of uh, at Victoria Riven Gordon that uh, has these. Uh, uh, and that plasmonic structures, essentially like these gold crescent gold structures where he can have proteins diffuse in and get inside this trap, get trapped there and he can get a signal uh, um, uh, and then analyze the protein when it's trapped in this area. Um, there's also people have tried to do, try to pass current through proteins because it turns out they, you think they might be insulators, but they're, they're not. They can conduct current, um, and it depends really on how you bind to where you bind and how you bind to the protein. And some people have tried to make these these wells where they had essentially planar electrodes and tried to have proteins come in and make connections uh, and have measured the conductance between proteins this way in an, in an array format, as opposed to do it with an STM tip. Um, I think that's really cool research, uh, yeah. Um, to be done, but yeah, but otherwise you're facing the problem of having things to diffuse inside uh, your well, but we know this works, right? Like uh, zero mode waveguide sequencing really works uh, uh, this way, right? By having things diffuse inside these wells, so. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. I was going to ask about um, how do you actually like trap a protein or uh, strand of DNA to put into the pore because for example for one of your mm -hmm. diagrams for DNA you showed that there's like some motor that keeps it in place and pushes that pushes it into the pore at some uniform rate and in that case would you when you're actually making your pore depending on what you're capturing how much do you need to change the pore other than maybe just it, it, its size um, to like have something that you, you attaches on top of it to push something through or like how does the process of capturing it work right so yeah so that's a good question and i'm sorry if i wasn't uh uh very clear on that at the beginning so the we apply a, a, an electric potential to drive ions through the pore and this gives us a signal but we also rely on this uh, there are multiple electrokinetic effects happening in the pore so you can trap you can bring something in so molecules will diffuse uh towards the pore do a random walk and then start to feel the, um, this is this is supposed to represent the decaying electric field outside the pore. And we'll do a random walk until it starts to feel uh, the electric field. So this is kind of the event horizon and it, and it enters the, the capture region and then we'll get pulled in. And so for DNA, for example, uh, it's so negatively charged that the electric field, if electrophoretic force is enough to kind of pull it in and to force it through. Now there's different capture regimes. So the molecule might actually try to attempt to enter multiple times before entering. Um, this is sort of a, a barrier crossing phenomenon. So the, the, the timescale for that differs. Um, uh, 
Um, but there are other forces at play as well. So you have, these are fluidic channels. This is a bad scale for the image, but there are um, charges on the surface of the pore and you're in water, you have got counter ions shielding those charges and you're uh, typically negatively charged surfaces. So you have positive counter ions. And so you have an opposite, opposing ele electrosmotic flow that opposes this uh, electrophoretic force on the DNA. Um, but uh, you can also try to rely on this uh, electrosmotic flow to actually capture proteins or capture neutral elements. So for, uh, because this is just the flow of water that brings things through the pore. So uh, some, some researchers are actually relying a lot on, EO, on EOF for, for capturing purposes. And it's actually something um, I've only mostly talked about uh, the electric force here uh, acting on, on, on our polymers. But the electrosmotic, the electrosmotic flow is also crucial in elongating the polymer and keeping the, the chain taut so that when you're doing sequencing, it's actually uh, well straight up and not sort of coiled a little bit because that, you know, there's also Brownian motion and things like this. And so you need to have the right amount of forces in your system to keep things straight. Yeah. So hope I've answered some of your questions, yeah. Okay, I think for the interest of time, we should stop here. Let's thank Vincent once again. And as you know, uh, the discussions can continue. There is coffee and refreshments in the undergraduate. Uh, it's still, in the still in the grad line. So we go back where we came from. Uh, yeah, yeah, I got, I wanted to talk about too many things. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I actually have a question directly about the Let me see if I can answer up. Um, so I, I really like the talk and I think it's really meaningful work. And uh, I've been wanting to apply for like a master at U Ottawa. So I'm wondering if uh, you're still accepting students that I'd be able to. Yep. So uh, what's your name? It's Kara. Kara, okay. Yeah. Send me an email. Mm -hmm. uh, I think today, uh, I mean, maybe we can chat in the coffee room now. Um, I am I am hiring students, uh, masters, PhD, uh, summer positions. Uh, really happy to chat. Uh, understand what your what is your program of study? Are you in physics? Are you in biochemistry? Are you in chemistry? Because I, I have I have multiple appointments, so there's lots of multiple possibilities. Even if you're in engineering as well, it's a possibility. Um, and we can talk about potential projects. If not in person, we can do it on Zoom uh, when I'm back in Ottawa. Okay. Uh, I if you have time, we can chat now, or I can send you an email and make up an appointment. He's in charge of my schedule. So. Yeah. So what I said is what I said. We're gonna go to have coffee. <laughs> we have to let them. So I'll see you there back in the lounge. Yeah. We'll, we'll be there for another half an hour, forty-five yeah. minutes. Which but room is it? We follow the grass. So they go is the grad lounge. So okay. just follow follow them. It's, okay. Is that it? If we don't have time to chat, just send me an email. Yeah. I am definitely looking for students, so okay. I'd be happy to chat with you. Okay. Sounds good. All right, thank you. Yeah. This is great. Uh, we'll go there. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I have I promise to take him to the grad lounge. So, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll chat chatter. So because you need to pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't yeah. don't don't forget anything. Yeah, well, yeah. that's it's not going to happen. I mean, I'm going to forget something. Yeah. <laughs> Anton and so Anton is always late, and we don't have meeting and arrive. So actually, we, we, so it was my fault too because I didn't I didn't pay so time. So we we spent the class.